Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. Hey, I'm excited to uh, be able to preach today. And uh, I can guarantee you this, that I've been praying, Lord, in this sermon, Lord, have your way. Amen? How many want to hear what the Lord has to say today? Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts, open our ears, and open our eyes to what you want to say today. We believe you have good things for your church, and we believe you're leading us through valleys into different places, Father God. You're leading us from mountaintop through valleys to different places. So, Lord, may we hear your voice in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, say amen. 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 Well, we've been in this series, Undivided, which is going to carry us through actually all the way to the end of November. And if you haven't been following along with us, you can get on our YouTube, you can get on our Facebook, you can go back, and that'd be really great for you to do. But as we're in this uh, portion today, that we're going to hit some scripture today, uh, I want to give us just a little bit of a a recap of what we are doing. Now, we have been in this Undivided series, as I said, and we're really wanting to focus on, on this key phrase, that we are trying to learn the way of love with an undivided heart for Jesus, his church, and his mission. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn the way of love so that we can have an undivided heart for Jesus, his church, and his mission. And as we've been preaching through the Bible, we've been in different parts of the book of Matthew, different parts of the book of Luke. Uh, Next week, we're probably jumping into one of the epistles, which is a letter into the first uh, century church. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, we talk about this every week, but the Bible is divided into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, which contains the history of the people of Israel, contains the covenants, the prophetic writings. And the New Testament, which was written since Jesus came, the story of his life, the story of his works, and then into the early church, the letters written by several different authors in the New Testament. And as we come today, I want to give you just a little picture of kind of the five focuses we've had that have led us up to today to keep us on track with where we're going, right? Because I know preachers think you remember everything. How many teachers are in the house today? How many times do you have to keep teaching people things all the time, right? How many husbands are in the house today? I didn't even have to make the joke. Here's, here's kind of the five things that we have been talking about. Number one, we've been talking about that as a church, as Sunrise, we're called into unity as a church and in our faith. We're called into unity to be undivided in our church and our faith. That means if God is trying to pull us apart, that's not the call. When you hear division, when you hear people talking division, that's not the call. That's not what God wants for us. He actually wants us to be undivided in our church and in our faith. Number two, we are invited to receive the love of Jesus. And isn't that the best invite ever? We, as people, are invited to receive the love of Jesus, invited to receive something good, something beneficial, something that blesses us. We're invited to receive that. Come on, someone say amen. Amen. Then we're called to love Jesus with everything. We're called to love him on every level. If you remember when uh, Coach Chris was talking, he was talking about the soul, loving God with all your soul, the nefesh, the nefesh, that you're everything. And it wasn't just uh, a segregated part of you. It's literally you're everything, your whole entirety. We were talking last week primarily about uh, love for God is evidenced through our love for others. As scripture calls them our neighbor, love for God is evidenced as love for others. Let me just ask you by show of hands, how many people had an opportunity this week to love someone who you might say, that's my neighbor, or that's someone that I'm called to love. How many people have an opportunity to do that? That's amazing. We need to pray for more opportunities. We need to pray for more opportunities. And lastly, I left you with this question last week, and I, and I want you to keep thinking about this question. How does my heart turn towards those in spiritual or practical need? How does my heart actually turn towards those people who are spir- have spiritual need or practical need? Now, I want to say one thing, too. Uh, Sometimes when I get a bottle of water, I get a bit excited. So if you got offended by me last week, please 
Forgive me. I'm not trying to offend you with water, okay? You will remember the sermon, but I'm not trying to offend you. So if you got offended by me, please just let it go because there was water over some people. But I'll also tell you this. Don't get offended for someone else. That's the bad thing in Scripture. You take someone else, you think someone else got mad, and you take, oh, that person's so bad. Don't do that. That's like the worst thing in the, in, the, in the Christian church. It's like you start getting mad because you think someone else is mad, and you don't even talk to them. Don't do that, man. I've seen this so many times, just wreck churches, wreck relationships. Well, that person's, no, 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 just don't do that, okay? So let's take a step back from that. We have been in Deuteronomy 6, known as the Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ichad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we're told in that scripture to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And that was the foundation that Israel knew in prayer in the mornings and in the evenings, repeated by Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. When he's asked what is the greatest commandment, but, but Jesus did something really interesting, is he tied the loving God to loving others. If you remember the text, it says the first commandment, the second is like it. Not like it in a, in a sense of it's the exact same thing. Like it in its importance because we see loving God through loving people. Now, we believe God is three persons in one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And a lot of times to symbolize this, we, we've seen the Trinity circle. We've got these three circles put together. And you kind of go, okay, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. It's not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, not the Son. Jesus is not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. But they're all one. They're all God. And so sometimes that can inform the way we look at things like ourselves. Heart, soul, strength, mind. Body, soul, spirit. We can, we can look at it. How, how are we made up? And a lot of times what we do is we, we consider these four circles. We go, okay, God's got, he's got my heart, but Lord, I need to give you my soul. Lord, you got my soul now, but then I still got to give you my mind. I'm having problems with my mind. But okay, Lord, I got the mind is, okay, now I'm going to move on. I'm going to give you some of my strength now. Now, it's interesting because we can, we can do a thing where we can be dipart or tripartite, and we can think, I'm, I'm a separate person. But the thing is, God has actually called us all together as one person to love him with everything. So let me give you an image that I think better describes the idea of the great commandment, the great, uh, the Shema from the Old Testament. Let me give you an image that I think defines it better for us. Can we put that image up? It's like this. It's like concentric circles of the same thing. The heart is the inner. The soul encompasses everything. Then there's our strength, and then there's our mind. It's like we are one thing. God is not calling you this day, would you love me, Kelly, with all your heart? And then tomorrow, could you try to love me with your mind? He's saying, Kelly, would you love me with everything? All of who you are. Everything that encompasses you. That's why I say we are called to love Jesus on every level. Are you with me? Now, the beauty about loving him on every level is that it does take us to examine our hearts, our minds, where we spend our time, the whole of our body. It calls us to actually look at those things. But it doesn't mean that my heart is separate from the rest of me. Because when we get into that, sometimes, church, we actually justify sin in our lives. We say, well, I really, I really, really love Jesus. I love to worship Jesus. I lift my hands. I pray. But yet, in the rest of your life, you're showing your heart to be divided because you love sin and you love pleasing yourself more than you love Jesus. And you end up doing that. Sometimes we go, man, I've got a really good discipline in my mind. I've got a good discipline. I've been thinking good things. I haven't been watching bad things. But yet in your body, you're really undisciplined and you're not paying attention to how God wants to call you into discipline. Do you know that he's given us a spirit of self-control? Do you know that? Okay, so that when you have the ability, speaking to myself, to order one patty or two patties, or to add bacon or cheese. It is a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. So what do I do? Yes, Jesus added it all. No, no, no. <laughs> Practice the spirit of self-control. Okay, so we had friends in town the other week, Jeremy and Brandy, pastors of Saints Church in, uh, in Glory Hills, up in Edmonton. And uh, Brandy's got a kind of restricted diet, so... They're like, well, we want to go out the last night before I would take you guys out for supper. And so, but she's like, I'm really like craving Red Robin. And if you've been, how many have been to Red Robin before? Hallelujah. My kids love that place. Like if there's a crisis, I can just go there and it like heals the crisis. But there's something that happens at Red Robin. And if you've been there, you know, bottomless fries. Really, really, literally, it's bottomless sides. Whatever side you order, except for those like luxury sides, like yam, yam fries, I think are. You can just go, you go bottomless. Bo bottomless in your eating, sorry. <laughs> you, you, sorry, just bring that back. 
Bring him back, coach. Bring him back, coach. But that's where you say, Lord, give me self-control. We can have our heart totally fixed on him. We can have our mind, but then we can be in our bodies undisciplined with what we're doing, with what we're eating, with what we're thinking. With our fitness, we can be totally undisciplined. We can be great discipline there, and with our heart, with our mind, we can be off. Jesus calls us to love him on every level. There's not one level that you are not called to love Jesus on. Why? Because Jesus loves you on every level. You know, church, there's not one part of you that Jesus goes, I can't love that. I can't love that. And a lot of times, we tend to do this thing where we put our sin before the love of God. Like somehow, sin is a barrier for the love of God. Let me just tell you this. Jesus loved you and loved me before we could even love him back. Sin is not a barrier to his love. His love came to conquer sin. A lot of times, we put all our problems before God, our worries, our anxieties. But God says, my love is actually greater than that. God loves you on every level, and we're invited to love God on every level. Are you with me today? Amen. Let's talk a little bit about God's love. How many have felt in the last month you've felt loved by God in an extraordinary way? Okay, for the rest of you, let's put our hands up right now. If you want to experience God's love, we can just ask him to come into this place. Lord, we ask you to bring your love into this place. Pour your love on hearts, Jesus. Pour your love on our minds. Pour your love on our souls. Pour your love on all our strength, Lord, that we would experience your love. And Father, where we have been tempted to put sin or our problems or our crises before your love, Lord, we choose to let your love come in. Lord, overwhelm us with your love today, especially those who have felt far from him. Lord, overwhelm us with your love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's talk about the love of God. In the book of Jeremiah, which is an Old Testament prophet, writing about the characteristic of God and his love. Jeremiah says this, speaking for the voice of God. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Come on, an everlasting love. That's like a good song. Like someone should write that, everlasting love. That'd be a good song to write. Oh, wait a second. Someone did write that song. God's love does not start at a place for you and end because it's everlasting. It's been there since creation passed and it's still there today and tomorrow. God's love is everlasting. Come on, someone say amen to that. It says this in Exodus 20 verse 6, God shows his steadfast love to a thousand generations. God is in the business of showing his love to people. This is what he does. This is why he went to the cross, the ultimate declaration of love. It's everlasting. It's steadfast. And then David responded back in Psalm 63, 3 and said, your steadfast love is better than what? Is better than Red Robin? Is, is better than some wings? Is better than my new car I have? Praise Jesus for Tesla. Come on now, Jesus. His steadfast love is better than life. Man, this is it. Exodus 26 tells us steadfast love to a thousand generations. And the psalmist says your steadfast love is better than life. His love is shown to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. It's steadfast. It's everlasting. And I've said before that when I read John 3.16, the part that I love about John 3.16 is the little word that's translated into English, so. God so loved the world. He so loved the world. He didn't hold it back. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a tiny teaspoon of my love. He said, I'm going to give you an everlasting flow of my love, a steadfast flow of my love. He so loved the world. His love is everlasting. His love is steadfast. His love is vast. And here's the best thing. It says this in Scripture that even if we are unfaithful to him, he is still faithful to us. This is the God who loves you, church. Are you with me today? Come on, it's everlasting, it's steadfast, it's vast. Romans 8, you've maybe read this before, but in verses 35 to 38, we read the powerful descriptors of the love of God, which tells us about death and fighting and nakedness and sword and all these things. It says, they cannot separate us from the love of God. In fact, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Man, I love that phrase. 
Do you know how I become more than a conqueror? Not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror? It's not because I've mustered my strength. It's not because I know my theology well. It's not because I have an amazing wife and family. It's because of the love Jesus has. How do you conquer, church? Because of the love Jesus has for you. Through Jesus and his love. His love is everlasting. His love is steadfast. His love is vast. Death can't separate us from his love. Someone say amen. amen. Paul, an early New Testament author, when he's writing, he, he's writing a prayer to the people in the churches gathered in Ephesus. And he says in chapter 3, Verse 18, may you have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. He's praying we'd have the strength even to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That is a big love, right? Something that you have to be prayed for that you will comprehend. That even when you're prayed for that you will comprehend is bigger than you can even imagine. This is the love of God. It surpasses knowledge. Come on, someone say Amen. Now, I need, I need a couple of volunteers today, and uh, Kevin, would you come up? I've pre-selected a couple of my friends here today. Kevin, would you come up? And uh, where's our great pastoral apprentice, Jonathan Malamura? Where is Jonathan? Is Jonathan here today? Rachel, where is your, where is your spouse? <laughs> He's disappeared. Okay, I'm going to call up another friend. Uh, actually, Sherry, you need to come up today. Come on, now, everyone welcome our wonderful wife, Pastor Sherry Wesby. This is awesome. This is going to be fun. Um, Kevin, do you mind if I mention that thing again? Can I say that? Okay. Kevin, we love you and we congratulate you. This guy celebrated on Friday night when you're totally sober. Loving Jesus. And it was awesome because we're together with like, it was, it's called the Sober Riders, right? Yeah. This is like a bunch of bikers. And Kevin kind of apologized. Hey, I'm sorry for these people. I'm like, no, man, those are my people. Like, if I go anywhere on a Friday night, I want to go hang out with them. I'm like, but I'll drive my Honda up there, and they'll look at me from their Harleys. And, no, but there's a couple Hondas in the club here. Yeah, okay. Let me ask you guys a question. Have you ever taught something that you haven't learned? Yeah. Sherry's a nurse. She just is teaching people in the hospital. Okay. Kevin, this is a Rubik's Cube. Have you ever solved a Rubik's Cube? No, okay, can you teach not. Sherry how to do it? We need like Jeopardy music right now. Oh. Got it? <laughs> it's, it's close. Hold on. Sherry, could you, could, you teach, could you teach Kevin how to solve that? Okay, so you take the right side and you twist it. And the left, you like that. And you give it a little... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, you, so you're not Rubik's Cube's champs. You, 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 okay. Does anyone know actually how to solve these things? Does it peel the stickers off? Oh, you, sir, uh, I'm not going to throw it. I'm going to take someone out there. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a beautiful little crane right here. This is an origami crane. This is made by our homestay daughter, Maho. Thank you very much, Maho. Origato, thank you. Um, Kevin, go. Let's cheer him on, everybody. Yes, he's, uh, it's, okay, yeah, that's a triangle. That's good. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think this could be, this could be an airplane. Yeah, go for it, yeah, go for it, bro. Okay, yeah, uh-huh, right. You are so close. There is about 75 folds in this little piece of paper. You are so close. Okay, okay, uh-huh, right. Okay, yeah, uh-huh, right, okay. The paper, okay. Okay, just, can you show the crowd to see how it's looking? Is it looking... Close? <laughs> Sherry, does it look close? Okay. Okay, what's, what, yeah, what's going to see what happens? What's, what's going to happen with this one here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see it. Oh, it's coming together. Yeah, that, that must be the wings of the crane. Right. Right. Okay, let's just see. Okay, go for it. Okay, give these two a round of applause here. <laughs> you guys can, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So have you ever tried to teach someone something you've never learned? It's not easy. I can watch the videos on YouTube and I see these people just flick, 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 flick. We actually had a friend, one of the Wolfram kids. What's his record, Sherry? Like he did a two by two in like under four seconds. 
a three point like one seconds or something. Like he's in, he was in a competition. And he's just like tick, 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 and it's done. I'm like whatever. Like he's serious, really. <laughs> Church, it's really hard to teach something to someone you haven't learned. Parents, you know it when you look at the way they do math now. You, come on, right? And you're like, I'm old. Like, when did we stop carrying numbers? Just, keep, just give me the calculator. Let, let me ask you this question. Have you ever tried to give something that you haven't received? Okay. Got a couple realtors here in the front. They're great people. Gary, have you ever seen someone squat on a property? and then try to sell it when it's not theirs. How well does that go? He's seen it. He's seen a lot. Gary has seen a lot. Kelly has seen a lot. How did that go? They ended up in jail. Up in jail. Yeah, that, doesn't, that doesn't work so well. Church, when we try to teach something we haven't learned, when we try to give something we haven't received, we end up in a really bad place. Why? Because you really have nothing to give. You got nothing to teach. Why is it so important to receive the love of Jesus? Because if we don't receive the love of Jesus, we really have nothing to give. We don't have anything to give. We can give out small deeds, but they're not filled with the love of Jesus. Church, if we haven't received the love of Jesus, we really have nothing to give. And I have a little image that I, that I did up here just to keep my brain in this realm of thought. And it, and it looks like this. We'll throw it up. You're called to receive the love of Jesus. You're, you're invited to receive the love of Jesus. And then you love him in return. And one of the best ways you do that is by loving others. Now, like the Jewish people in the day, when, when, when the man asked, who is my neighbor? Remember, he's seeking to justify himself because Jewish people thought loving their neighbor was loving fellow Jews. You're not just called to love people in the house of God. That's easy to do. Jesus actually said, even people who are criminals, they basically love each other. That's easy to do. You can love people who are like you. It's loving people who are not like you. Loving people who are different from you. Loving people who might be nothing like you. So I'm keeping this image in my head. I, I drew it out for myself because, Lord, I need to receive your love. So I literally have something to give to people. I'm going to be empty if I don't receive your love. So in prayer this morning as I was praying, I just felt like the Lord came and just gave me this phrase. It's a very simple phrase, but the Lord said, we are objects of his affection. Whoa. Just camp on that for a minute. You are an object of God's affection. And a lot of times it depends on the church we grew up in or the theology we understand. The first thing we've understood is how broken and how sinful we are. That is true, but that does not preclude how loved you are. And how much you're an object of his affection. Look at the person beside you and tell them, you're an object of God's affection. Oh, not that close. We leave room for the Holy Spirit there, okay? <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> we are objects of God's affection. Now, let me tell you something. When you receive something good, what do you do? When you, when you hear, when you get good news, you receive something good, you get a free meal somewhere along the way, what do you do? You share it. Okay, can I tell you a story? My, my, one of my mentors and pastors used to say, time out, this is story time, this isn't preaching time. Thanks, Pastor Rick, I'll take that. <laughs> Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. There was a special event in town. No, Monster Jam was just the night before. This was, this was an NBA game. Canada, preseason, season tour to Vancouver. My raps were in town! And some of our most beloved basketball fans were in the Philippines with their family, bringing them back. Uh, we're going to have a new Filipino family waiting for, I don't know how many years, how many years have we been, eight, eight or nine years for them to come or something like that. It's been crazy. So I bought tickets, surprised Pastor Braden, Pastor Lisa and I, we made a kind of a scheme to like give him these tickets and he didn't know. He's texting me like five days before asking me about the tickets. I'm like, Lisa, did you tell him? And so I'm like pushing him off and no, I, my buddy's coming. Blah, blah. Anyway, so anyway, we surprise him with these tickets and they say, we're going to give you the tickets by email. So I'm eagerly awaiting an email. Like I want tickets. I want to go to the game. Game's at five o'clock. It's currently three o'clock. I'm driving to pick up Pastor Braden. No tickets. <laughs> 
We're pastors. We have tickets in the nosebleeds of the nosebleeds of the nosebleeds. If you've ever sat, if you've ever sat in section 301, you know that's the worst place to watch any event ever. You're like on the west side. You're just like, you're up there. You're just like literally, you, they, what they do is like in airplanes, they have those masks that come down for you because the oxygen, because it's so thin up there. And you're breathing in. It's like, please put the mask on yourself first and your children second. So three o'clock, we have no tickets. So as we're driving to Vancouver, Pastor Braden has a great way of managing his uh, worry or anxiety about these situations. He's, he does really good. And so he's on the chat and we're chatting and we finally get someone on this chat from, from the ticket agency and they say, okay, the person has till 420 to actually send you the tickets. 420? Like, what a weird time. Why'd you pick that time? So 420, we're like, okay, we can't do anything uh, until 420 and the don't send the So then what happens? We ask them, what happens if you don't get the, we don't get the tickets? Well, you've got a guarantee. We either give you your money back or we'll give you some other tickets. So I'm thinking, how do you get tickets last minute to the Raptors game? Like, how do you do this? Uh, so I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, worst comes to worst. We just have supper downtown Vancouver. It's nice, and we head back and you know watch the game on TSN or whatever. And we are now 4:20. We're standing outside Rogers Arena. People are flooding in with all their jerseys and everything. And we're in our jerseys. He's got like he's got the Vince Carter on. I got my DeRozan jersey. We're ready for this game, but we have no tickets. We can't get in. So by this time, because Braden is so savvy on on the Google, he has found a phone number. So he's calling them while I'm chatting with them. And at the same time, the person picks up the phone. The person says, hi, my name is Catherine. I'll be your assistant. Here's my order number. Here's my name. Here's my email. I want some tickets. I don't have tickets. Can I use the whatever fan protect guarantee? And she goes, oh, let me look into it. So we're on the phone and we're kind of keeping them on the phone because we don't want to lose this person on the phone because we want to get into this game. Like this is hype for us. Pastor Braden has never been to an NBA game. This is like a dream. It's 10 months late. It was supposed to be for his 26th birthday, but it's 10 months late. Anyway, so we're on the phone. We're on the chat. And then they say to us, Look for an email in your email box. Okay, awesome. Check my email. Oh, look. It says, the seller could not provide the tickets. Please look below. Please choose one of the options below. Click here for a refund or click here for tickets. Click here for tickets. I'm like, what kind of tickets are there going to be? Like, what's worse than 301? In, in <laughs> Come on, you know if you've been to a game and you sat in 301, it's just bad. So we're scrolling down. We're like, oh, what's it? Oh. And then this one section, it's like 113. It's kind of like one of those kind of half sections that's not quite in the lower bowl, but not quite in the upper deck. And you're kind of right there. Well, that's not bad, but it's in the corner. Whoa, section 115. Oh, that's like a corner. That's even better. And then we're scrolling down. We're like, oh, wait a second here. And we're talking to the phone. I'm telling them, we can have any of these tickets? We can pick it. Yeah, you can pick it. no charge, no charge. So then all of a sudden we scroll up. Section 117. Section 117, that's center court. Center court! We scroll down a bit more. Floor seats west? We had to pick between floor seats west court or we had to pick between center court. Well, we choose center court because then you see everything. If you're west, you're on the floor still, but you only see half of it. So then we're like, okay, click that section. Oh, row 25. Oh, that's okay. Row 20. Scroll up, scroll up. Row 10 center court tickets? Yes, please. Thank you, Jesus. Ding, 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 ding. So then we get the email and we get the tickets. And we have in our hand tickets for center court. We're thinking like, oh, this feels like way too good to be true. So we get there and we realize we're not in, we're not in the cheap seats. We're actually in the plush, big black seats that are there. You just go, oh, right, right. It's literally like people come serve you there. I think, I don't know. Anyway, so during the halftime, uh, I just leaned over to the guy and said, hey, you enjoying the game? Yeah, I'm enjoying the game. He goes, yeah, yeah. I was here last night for Peter Gabriel. It was a really awesome concert. But, you know, we got these tickets. How would you get your tickets? So I bought them through this website. I said, do you mind me asking? And what she paid. Okay, let me just say this. <laughs> Pastor Braden and I got a $1,200 upgrade. $1,200. That's like favor of God. Why do I tell you this story? Because I've told this story like 20 times this week to anyone who will listen. Why? Because when something good happens to you and you receive something good, what do you do? You share it. You talk about it. You're like, yeah, we got a promotion. Not only that, but when we went to the restaurant later, they screwed up an order. We got two times the amount of wings we were supposed to get because they gave us the wrong ones. So, so supper was like double portion, but this one was like 10 times. It was like 10x. What happens when you receive something good? You tell about it. Why do we need to receive the love of Jesus? We receive something good. What do we do? We talk about it. We tell people about it. Church, when you receive something good, the natural thing is to tell about it. And we need to be people who receive his love. Receiving his love is of utmost importance. If you have your Bible with you, just turn over to Romans 5.5. 5. I want to read one verse, and then I'm going to keep going. 
In this book of Romans, written by a New Testament author named Paul, we believe his testimony because he encountered Jesus. And he talks in this passage about walking through sufferings, knowing that it produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. How many people have been through sufferings and you knew it produced something in your life? You get on the other side and it starts producing something in your life. But he says this in verse 5, and I want you to hear this because it's so important. I love this verse. And hope does not put us to shame, and listen very carefully, because God's love has been poured into where? Our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hope does not put us to shame. Why? We don't have hope just because we can muster it. We don't have hope just because we read the right Facebook post and it was encouraging. We don't have hope because our children didn't disobey or they did well. In the, we have hope because God's love has been poured into our hearts. That's how you have hope. And he says it's by the Holy Spirit that he pours his love into our hearts. Receiving his love is of utmost importance. We are objects of his affection. And when we're objects of his affection, he wants to pour his love on us and into us. Are you with me, church? Church, if we do one thing in these seasons here when we gather like this, you should be able to bless God and worship and receive his love. That's it, so that you can pour it out. For your family, for those who don't know Jesus, for those around you, now, a number of years ago, there was this uh, trend and this fad that went around, and you might have had one of these bracelets. You might still be wearing one now. Uh, just throw it up on the screen there. You might have had this. What's that? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Yeah, like tons of people capitalized on this, like millions and millions of dollars on what would Jesus do. The interesting thing about that, it's not bad, but it's all about doing Okay? Now, the interesting thing about Jesus is all of his activity came from his identity as a son of God. He didn't just do to do to do to do. And likewise with us, all of our activity needs to come from our identity as children of God. That's it. So there was, there was the what would Jesus do? And, and we were supposed to wear these because we get in a situation where we say, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm not Jesus right now with my children. I need help. You're just like, you're praying. And then, you know, the second one came out. It was push. Did anyone have a push bracelet? What was push? Pray until, until something happens, right? We did. Okay, because if you were going to do what Jesus did, you needed to pray until something happens because you realized you weren't like Jesus at all. And we're like, oh, man. I never put one of those bracelets on because I'm like, <laughs> like, that's like the worst thing. It's like, please, Jesus, do not, do not put a fish sticker on the back of any one of our vehicles. Like, Lord, Lord Jesus knows we don't need that, okay? Don't do that for us. For you, you're probably way more courteous driver than the Westby clan. Anyway. <laughs> I think it's not what would Jesus do? Because I think that's, again, about doing. Then there was a pastor in the States, and he's been in the news recently, but he, he gave this great phrase, and he preached around this, and the phrase was this. It was, what does love require? I think we got it there. What does love require? And he tried to get people to grab onto this phrase. What does love require? What does love require? What does love require? It's pretty good. But the problem is, requirements feel like duty, right? And guess what happens? You can do the duty things for so long, but then after you do do the do do's, you just there, it's all done. Like you you finish it, it's done. What is the? So it feels too much like duty. But I think there's a greater question that God has for us, considering His love is steadfast and everlasting, considering His love is vast, and nothing can separate you from this love. Considering that his love surpasses knowledge, but Paul prays that we would understand this love. Here, I think, is the better question. What does this love lead me to? What does this love lead me to? Can we get that up there? That was the cue. What does this love lead me to? Because, you know, when you've encountered the love of Jesus, and you see someone who needs love, I don't think what's required of me. I don't want to think, what would Jesus do? I want to think, what would this love that's loved me, what would it lead me to do? When I think of people around me that I'm going to experience later today, tomorrow, when I even go, I got some doctor's appointments, when I go see doctor, what will this love I've experienced lead me to? 
When you think of people who are spiritually broken or practically broken, what will this love lead us to? And I had a great question brought by one of our guys the other day. He said, well, pastor, like, what if there's like, what if there's 20 people? How, how do you, how do you minister? How do you love? How do you show the love of Jesus? Like 20 people. And there's this phrase that someone taught me years ago. And it was, I, I don't think I wrote it up there because I'm not that smart. Um, the question, the question, what, what do you do when there's lots of people to love? And the answer was simply this. A pastor said to me, you do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. You do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. So you ask God, God, highlight that one. Highlight that one. So I could do for that one what I wish I could do for everyone. What does this love lead me to? I want you to think. Think when you see a neighbor who's close to you and they're in spiritual poverty. They don't know Jesus. They're, they're going after everything else. What does this love lead you to? Think of when you see someone who's homeless and broken. Matt, you don't need to go far. You don't need to go far. Tents are all over. You, you drive, you see them. You see a tent. What does this love lead me to? Now, I'm not advocating that you shouldn't be safe. Like, be safe, be wise. But when the Spirit of God leads you, he's already got you. He's got you, okay? What does this love lead you? When you see someone who's sick, someone who's in the hospital, what does this love lead you to? When you see someone who is in grief, who's lost a significant person in their life, what does this love lead you to? I promise you it won't lead you to just walk by them. You might not know all the words, but I promise you this, when people are walking through grief, spoken of one who has walked through grief, you don't sometimes need words. You just need presence. You just need presence. What does love lead you to do when you see someone who you find it, find it hard to love? Our challenge is that there's many other things that are leading us. There's many other things that can, can get us and can pull us and draw us. Our desire for finances, our desire for money, our desire to not be in debt, that can be the thing that leads us. Sometimes our kids and our family can be the thing that, that leads us, but this love is what's called to lead us. Sometimes, you know, our beliefs can lead us more than Jesus leads us. Our own opinions, our own ideas, our own beliefs can lead us more than Jesus leads us, than this love leads us. Sometimes we have these beliefs that like, oh, everyone would be fine without me, and you get really negative in your life. No, no, no. Jesus calls us to be together as a body. Sometimes we say, oh, no, the church doesn't need me. They don't need me to serve. Or the, the church doesn't need my finance. No, no, no. Don't put your beliefs before the love of Jesus, okay? Sometimes it's our own selfishness our own attitudes, our own sinful desires. Let me ask you the question, if this love isn't leading you, what is leading you now? Is it your career path? Is it your heritage, your history, something that is leading you? I want to just touch on two quick stories from the book of Acts. You have your Bible with me. Your Bible with you, turn to Acts 8. In Acts 8, we... we meet a man named Simon, the magician, also known as Simon the sorcerer. What happens to him when he hears the good news? He accepts Jesus Christ. It says in verse 12, he was baptized. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, continued with Philip's, Philip, and they were seeing great signs and wonders, great miracles. Now, as we go down a little further, this man has given his heart to the Lord. Verse 18 of, of Acts 8, now, when Simon saw that the Spirit, being the Holy Spirit, was given through the laying on of hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. What's going on in Simon's life? He's had an encounter with Jesus. Now, scholars argue whether he had a true encounter or not. But the whole point, there was something leading Simon that wasn't the love of Jesus. He was led by pride and power to want that very power that the apostles had to convey the Spirit and see the Spirit work on people when they laid hands on. What was leading him? Pride, power, arrogance. Turn over one page to chapter 10. Starting in verse 9, we read the story of Peter. He's receiving a vision. He's on the house top of the sixth hour, it says, and he, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And he fell into a trance. 
And it says, a great sheet descended, bearing, uh, being let down from the four corners of earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, by no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice came again a second time. What God has made unclean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up. So what was happening in the story? There was things in the Old Testament that you were prohibited, prohibited from eating. Peter's hungry, falls into trance. God speaks to him and says, don't call any of that unclean because I'm making it clean. So through the work of Jesus, he's fulfilled all the ceremonial laws of cleanliness and uncleanliness, and now it's all fulfilled in Jesus. And also he's talking about the people who are the Gentiles, who a Jew wasn't supposed to associate with. And he's opening his heart. So what's going on with Peter? What's leading Peter? Peter is led more by tradition and his self righteousness than he is by the love of Jesus. So Jesus has to speak to him in a vision and a trance of food coming down. Here we had Simon who was led by pride and power. Now flip over with me to the book of Acts chapter 16. This is Paul. We read from him today, a New Testament author, a leader. Acts 16 verses 8. This is when they are on mission trips. They've just met a young man named Timothy. And it says this in verse, sorry, verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to per preach the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. So passing by Mysia, went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing, urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to him. Church, what does this love lead you to? For Simon, power and pride led him to want to give money so that he could convey the spirit of God. For Peter, he let tradition and self-righteousness lead him. Worship team, would you come? But here we have the picture of Paul. And if you've never heard about the life of Paul, Paul was a person who is dead set against Jesus. He was known for killing Christians and imprisoning Christians and working against all those who were following Jesus in the early church. But he met Jesus in a powerful way one day and it radically changed his life. And here as Paul is going about his everyday ministry that he's doing that's recorded in this book of Acts, He's trying to go into Asia, but it says the Spirit prevented him. He said, no, not here. And then God gives a vision of this man from Macedonia and says, no, no, no. This is the way. I love this example of Paul because he's not led by pride and power. He's not led by tradition or self-righteousness. He's led by the very vision of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Church, today as we come, what does this love lead you to? And a lot of times we just default that we think of people who are in, in practical poverty. But it's, it's all across the board. What does this love of Jesus, a vast, steadfast, everlasting, nothing can separate you from this love that is beyond all us. What does this love lead you to? When you leave this place, you see a person. What does this love lead me to? What does this love lead me to? When you're at home with your kids, what does this love lead me to? When you go to work, what does this love lead me to? Church, because there's a chance that a ton of other things are leading us. But Jesus wants us to be led by one thing and one thing only. Led by his love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand with me today? Lord, we thank you that you're here today by your presence. And so, Lord, we open our hearts to you. And if you would, just put your hand over your heart, symbolizing your whole life. Lord, today, where we have let other things lead us, where we've let pride and our desire for power lead us, where we have let our own traditions lead us, our own beliefs lead us, where we've been led by the love of money or finances, when we've been led by our family in ways that you're not leading God. We say, Lord, we want to come back to letting you lead us. Lord, as we sang earlier today, we lay our crowns down. We surrender. We surrender to you. Jesus, move upon our hearts that this love would lead us to respond to need all around us. 
Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We pray your goodness and your grace would cover us. And that that love we receive would be poured out through and to others. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship, church. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.